Socialism and crisis, it seems like we've always been in one, doesn't it? You know, but if it wasn't for the struggle, would it be worth being part of? Um, my union, just a quick background, we're the Bakers Food and Allied Workers Union. Uh, some people think we're quite new. We've actually been here since 1847. Um, and um, we are the oldest, apart from the BMA um, union uh, in existence. Um, in, in our history, uh, we, we organised in, in London with a, with, a, with a revolutionary woman called Joanna Law, who was one of the most um, you know, prolific speakers on the circuit at the time. Uh, and when she used to organise bakeries on our behalf, what she used to do is get the local workforce and the local community to go and surround them so they couldn't move products in or out. Uh, obviously, it's something that we've learnt uh, to do over the years. So when we've had dispute, and anybody who saw our recent dispute, which was at Hovis just a few years ago, knows that we've still remembered how to surround a factory. Um, so our history is, is quite radical, and we have always uh, seemed to uh, recognise the importance of trade unionism and politics. You know, I mean, obviously, when we was organising in London, not only were we saying about, you know, the need to organise to improve pay uh, to, in your workplace, but also organising your community to get involved in politics, because we recognise that politics is the key in many instances to improving our lives. Not always, not always can I say that we should rely on legislation to change our lives, because actually, most legislation happens on the back of the demands that working people make uh, when we come collectively together. Now, obviously, um, we, we, we've seen in recent years in particular, I mean, and I just read this morning how, you know, apparently a few years ago, Chuck Yuma was the front runner to take over at the Labour Party. Uh, but now we've moved so radically, he doesn't feel that he's at home uh, in the Labour Party. But all I've got to say on that is, you know, we've had Ramsay MacDonald types in our party for, for many, a, a many a year. In fact, we've had them for nearly two centuries. So, I mean, for, for us, um, you know, the fact that, that, that those Ramsay MacDonald's types have, have been in our party. I know some people like to refer them to as Blairites, but I think, though, no, treachery has been going on further than uh, Blair and what Blair offered the Labour Party. Uh, I think it goes all the way back to when, you know, politicians, you know, get this idea that power, uh, power is something that, that gives them an entitlement uh, to a better standard of living than the rest of us. I mean, I don't mind anybody having a better standard of living than me as long as I have the opportunity to achieve it. Um, but you see, politicians don't seem to think that way, do they? And I mean, they use diversion tactics, they use discrimination, they use whatever agenda they can to make sure that, that we are unable you know, to, to achieve what we deserve as, as people. And I think what we've seen recently in, the, in relation to the, the issue around uh, Brexit in particular is, is that opportunity that politicians have used to divide our communities. I mean, they only want to, all they ever want to talk about is the issue around, you know, it's, it's what the people voted for, it's, it's what the people wanted, but their, their, their narrative is normally about pe this people, you know, wanting to push people out of the country. Well, actually, I don't believe people vote, yes, there will have been some, but I don't believe people voted to stop people from coming here or to stop us from moving anywhere. I mean, for us, freedom of movement is a critical issue. And for us, we believe it's a human right to live wherever you want in the world. We don't believe in land and borders. And, and to us, you know, the Labour movement needs to get behind that message too. Because the reality, the reality of, 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 of uh, you know, for us on Brexit was that why should our freedom of movement be tied to a trade deal? Why is it not our right, the same, the same as a right for the rich and the powerful to be able to move to anywhere they want to live? Why is it a right for them to buy up our council estates and build their luxury apartment buildings so they can use them and keep them empty for investment properties while we have 600 people dying on the streets of our country? I don't believe, and our union doesn't, but my union doesn't believe that the issue was ever to do with the rights of people to live wherever they want in the world. And I think, you know, as, as a movement, I think it's very, very important we understand that division is used to ensure that we're kept in our place. And when we realise our strength comes from collectivism and we realise that by combining we can change our society, then we will get to the place that we deserve to be. And that's why, obviously, from, from our perspective, you know, when, the, when they start talking about the Brexit crisis, I mean, you know, and the people's vote, and, you know, I think it's very, very, you know, interesting that those people behind the people's vote, behind the people's vote, I mean, you've never heard them talk about austerity, do you? You know, these are most of those people that talk, that talk about the people's vote. What did, what, did they, what did they do when they had the opportunity to show leadership and say we will oppose the cuts? 
They sat on their hand and they abstained. That's why Jeremy Corbyn actually, you know, actually was propelled to become the leader of the party. And he was propelled to become the leader of the party because people were fed up of not having a party that stood up for the interests of us. And that's why people joined on their masses to make sure that the Labour Party actually went back to its roots and started recognising it had a role to play in building a, a working class movement that was about being radical and about changing our society. So aspiration and hope was not something that was an historic thing from the past, but the right for all of us for into the future. And that's why, you know, when you look at what happened around the election of Jeremy Corbyn, I, I strongly believe that that's why people joined and they were so eager and enthusiastic about the, the qualities and the policies that, that they were talking about. Because, of course, most of the people that were standing in that, like, that election, they all looked like one, and each, one, and each, one another. And, of course, they only represented a certain type of politics. You know? So I think that was the reason why uh, Corbyn uh, became the leader uh, of the Labour Party. And since then, obviously in 2017, when we saw, actually, I don't think it was that radical a manifesto. I mean, it was just basically a social democratic manifesto that's, you know, that's throughout Europe. I mean, I think it should go a lot further. You know, I think it should be a bit more radical. You know, but I mean, it was a good start. It was a good start. You know, but for, 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 for my trade union, you know, I mean, we, 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 we want to know why it is that we have legislation that allows, you know, debt, if you're, if you're a corporation, to be wiped out. But if you're a private individual, it can't be wiped out. Why, why, why is that? You know, we have to stay impoverished and in poverty. Of course, they'll give us some more debt so we can pay the debt that we currently have off, just so we can maintain our ability to be kept into debt, because it's all about keeping us enslaved, isn't it? It's all about keeping us divided. It's all about keeping us enslaved. You know, and what I, what, what I believe and what my union believes is, is very clearly that what, when we come together, we can make a real change, you know, and we've demonstrated that throughout our history too. I mean, when, when, when obviously Clem Attlee, I mean, radical, wasn't he? I mean, you know, they used to, they used to t suggest he was a, you know, a Marxist and a Trot and all of, those, all of those words that they seem to want to paint, you know, leaders of the Labour Party with. But this was a guy that actually was an imperialist, you know, and he moved, he moved to socialism, but not based on, like, the, the British version of it, it was the American version, if anything. Um, and, and obviously, you know, became the Prime Minister of the country and you know what, the country became better because of it. You know, and if our media, you know, didn't lie and misrepresent what people think or what people should be able to achieve, if they didn't actually, you know, just, just perpetrate information that was designed to undermine uh, people in our community, if they didn't, you know, perpetrate the, de uh, the deliberate attempt to cause division, then perhaps we could actually see that the policies that the Labour Party are currently offering, you know, can, can give us all a better society, one that's built on fairness, one that's built on equality, and one that's built on justice, because justice, justice is a very, very important issue. I mean, we, we're, we're part of a, a campaign called Fast Food Rights. We started it in 2014. The Fast Food Rights also had a hashtag which was called Hungry for Justice. Hungry for Justice was about identifying the key issues that were facing us as working people and people in the, who live up and down um, our, our country. And it was about saying, actually, you know, at this particular time in 2014, it become normal for, for people to be on zero hours. I know, I know they've exploded even more since. It was normal for, for people to be paid poorly. It was normal, you know, for, for, for discrimination in the workplace based on your age. I mean, it's still normal today. But people now understand the importance of saying that it's absolutely not right. It's not right to, to force people onto zero hours contracts. And, you know, it's not right to, to force people into low paid employment. And it's not right, you know, that we discriminate against young people just because of their age. You know, if people go to work and they do the same job, they should be say, paid the same rate of pay. You know, and that's what the Hungry for Justice campaign was all about. It was about saying we all deserve justice and we all deserve the right uh, to... Uh, to a decent life. We all deserve the ability to, to live a life that entitles us. Entitles us, because I do believe it's about entitlement. Entitles us to all of the basic things that we deserve as human beings. And those are a safe, secure, long-term home. You know, what is wrong with people having a decent home? What is wrong with that? I mean, surely that's the basic right of an individual. The right to a job that gives you security and your employment. What is wrong with workers having security at work? What is wrong? 
you know, alongside that security, having a wage that means that you don't have to fill in endless forms each week to demonstrate you're living in poverty so the state can give you an handout. Let's make the employers pay and let's say, you know, it's right that employers who are making massive profits, I mean, McDonald's, $21 billion on average a year, don't pay the taxes, funny that, most corporations that pay low pay don't pay taxes, not in this country anyway. When, when, but just going back to the European Union, when the European Union had an opportunity to demonstrate it learnt the lessons of people's frustration with them, because they were sick and fed up that the European Union doesn't seem to stand up for us. When McDonald's was in front of them, they said, yes, you haven't paid your taxes. You've shortchanged the British public by 1.5 billion. But you know what? You just exercised the same right that other corporations have done too. So don't worry about it. That's one and a half billion. And by the way, that one and a half billion, if that would have been in our coffers, maybe Grenfell would never have happened. Maybe our fire stations wouldn't have shut down. Maybe our shore starts wouldn't be closing. Maybe our libraries that our children need for a decent education to learn about our history and about the knowledge that we, we deserve as human beings. Maybe they wouldn't be closing down because that one and a half billion would be able to fund them. In the same way, if we're not making people rely on state handouts and making employers pay a wage that people can afford to live on, then we can use those, those changes in our society those things that are being channeled into corporate. I mean, to me, it's corporate welfare. It's not people welfare, it's corporate welfare. Because if that money wasn't going to those workers who were working for those profitable employers, we could fund our NHS. We could bring back free tuition fees. We could make sure we have a society that's fit and our public sector is invested in. And that's why, you know, that's why actually, you know, they oppose Corbyn. Because those are the policies he stands for. Those are the things that he believes in. And that's why, you know, we need to get this message, you know, into, into every part of our community. We don't build around division. We build around collaborations and collectivism. We don't, we don't win by being, by, by being divided. We win by recognising it doesn't matter where you're born in the world. When we stand together, when we fight together, we'll always win together, you know. And our history, like I said, has demonstrated it. You know, you look at working class history, you look at what we've achieved, you know, from male suffrage to, to, to female suffrage, you know, to the building of the NHS, which was built on the back of a desire of people for a better life after the World War I, when they were promised, they were promised that society would be better. And again, the politicians let them down. But the result of that, what, that, that election in 1945 was a result of people's desire to get the change that they should have got at the end of World War I. And that's why I think it's important. I think it's important we defeat the idea that somehow, you know, the nationalists have the answer, that, they, that, that somehow patriotism belongs in the hands of, uh, of these right-wing uh, people that think, up to me, right-wing right -wing, uh, people like Tommy Robinson and the rest of them, that they're just the enablers of the status quo. They represent, they represent the, uh, the, the, the class system. They represent, you know, the rich and the powerful because it's their division and their hate that makes sure that our communities are divided. And again, I come back to the importance of collectivism because that's how we build our strength. That's where our power is. We can change the world when we stand together and the world is ours. And we have the right to live wherever we choose. And we have the right, the right to a life and an expectancy that the generations that come after us, their lives will be better and improved because of what we've done in the society that we've created. Thank you very much, Solidarity. Uh, I'm very proud to again share a platform with uh, Ian Hodson. In fact, we do a bit of a, a double act uh, for the last uh, period. Speaking of meetings up and down the country to bring back uh, Labour's socialist vision, the Clause 4, which was passed in 1918 under the impact of the Russian Revolution, which committed the Labour Party to doing away with capitalism, doing away with the system where profit is the king, where everything is geared to profit, to do away with that and bring about a society based in the interests of, of the majority of people, of planning it and have an economy run for the needs of people. Today, of course, things are certainly happening, not only in Britain, but around the world. But I was delighted to see yesterday those uh, 
what, tens of thousands, if not more, of uh, school children, if you want to call them, school students, who have uh, very young, who realize there's uh, something, something fundamentally wrong, not just the environment, uh, but the, the system is broken, and they're drawing very, very radical, I would say, uh, conclusions, and above all, prepared to uh, not just sit down and take it, but to voice those uh, issues. Like that is a, a great sign of uh, a new development in Britain where people are becoming awakened to, to the need to change society itself. And there's some mood amongst young people. Again, is a, a reflection of the, the bitterness and anger also of in society. And I, I agree with Ian, that's one of the reasons why Jeremy Corbyn won the leadership of the Labour Party because of the pent-up frustration after years and years of whereby the Labour Party was no different from the Tory Party in reality, or the Liberal Party. And that uh, the actions, of course, of uh, Blair and that, not just to get rid of the socialist commitment of Clause 4, but to engage with uh, American imperialism in Iraq, and where, I would say, tens of well, hundreds of thousands of, of Labour Party members turned they back on the Labour Party. And we made the point it wasn't them leaving the Labour Party at all. It was the party, if you like, deserting its real aims and objectives. Now there are, uh, given the fact we're in a, a Marxist Student Federation conference, it's worth uh, reminding our, ourselves of a, few, of a few points. I mean, uh, it's often been said over a long period of time that the Labour Party owes more to Methodism than it does to Marxism. Uh, you could say, well, there might be a little grain of truth in that, that uh, Methodists did, certainly did involve themselves in the building of the early trade unions. But I would say that uh, Marxism also played a very important role in the history of the British Labour Movement and its origins, and uh, particularly the building of, uh, of trade unions. And in the 1880s and the 1890s, where we had new unionism being created, it was led above all by Marxists. People like uh, um, Will Thorne, who was a member of the Social Democratic Federation, the first Marxist organization in Britain. And he became the leader of the uh, gas workers. Um, then that became today's union of the, the GMB, in fact, uh, one of the executive members of the union was a, a person called Ellen, Eleanor Marx, who carried out agitation amongst the workers in the East End of London. Uh, you have uh, people like uh, Ben Tillett and uh, Tom Mann, who uh, built the Dockers Union, which became the Transport and General Workers Union, which is the union of Unite today. Uh, therefore, Marxists have played a very important role. In fact, they agitated, I would say, for an independent party of Labour before the Labour Party was even created. And when the Labour Party was created, the Marxists participated. The Social Democratic Federation was an important uh, part, a component part, of the birth of the Labour Party. In fact, the Fabians, who we're perhaps all aware of, they are the ones who opposed the creation of the Labour Party and they thought they, that the workers should stick to the Liberal Party at that time. Um, however, in 1901, the Marxists in the, in the Labour Party put forward a resolution saying that the Labour Party should be committed to socialism because when it was created it was just a party of working people to be represented in Parliament and they thought it should go much further and they put a resolution up calling for the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. And it was defeated. And those people m walked out of the Labour Party in a very sectarian manner. Teachers, but by events. Big events shake up things, shake up the working class. Make them think. Make them question. And it was the events of the First World War and above all, the Russian Revolution which made the Labour Party Conference in 1918 adopt a, a new constitution, above all this, this clause 4, to secure for the workers 
by hand or by brain the full fruits of their industry and the most equitable distribution thereof based upon the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. And therefore the Labour Party became at that time a socialist party. But of course uh, the Labour Party was made up as uh, Ian intimated not just of workers who wanted to change society but also attracted careerists who wanted to use it as a vehicle for their own particular ends. And as a result, uh, this idea of socialism was put on the back burner. Clause 4 was just seen as a museum piece, really. And uh, as a result, you know, we are where we are today, where we are perhaps further away from socialism, even after six Labour governments, than we were back in 1918. And of course, the difference and the big question now is that Marxism has become more relevant today. And it's not uh, an accident that uh, Jeremy Corbyn had paid tribute to Karl Marx, that uh, John MacDonnell said he was a Marxist and is influenced by Marxism. Many individuals in the party have been influenced in that way, including uh, one of the leaders of the left wing who created the National Health Service, Nye Bevan, who said in his book, I've got it here, uh, in place of fear, that if he has any education at all, he was in the education of Marxism, which allowed him to see the realities of life itself. And therefore, it's a tradition in the movement. And now it's becoming more relevant, I would say, than ever before, because of the crisis of capitalism, not only in Britain, but on a world scale, that the British workers are facing very hard times in the last 10 years real wages have fallen by a bigger proportion than any decade since the napoleonic wars 200 years ago you have the austerity the attacks they're relentless even if you have a job the exploitation is more vicious today than in living memory and therefore there's discontent there's discontent there's a feeling something must be done there's a there's the distrust in political parties. There have been for a long time. And therefore the Corbyn phenomenon, if you like, is born out of this frustration and a desire for a new way out. And it is, in my opinion, a great thing. I would say it's an advance, a big advance, that the Labour Party has been transformed. It's now a membership of nearly 600,000. The uh, right wing are on the, how can I say, the defensive, I said they are preparing a split, as you see by the newspapers. You know, the Labour Party is not as it should be. In other words, where it was carrying out promises for big business, it was fine. But now it's talking about changing society, then that's a bit different ma matter altogether. And I say to them, well, good riddance if they want to go. Because we should cleanse the Labour Party of careerism. The Labour Party should be a vehicle for the working class to achieve its emancipation. That's what it was created for. But it is the duty also, I would say, of Marxists not to stand on the sidelines, but to be involved in this movement and to join the Labour Party, to fight for the left in the Labour Party, and yes, to go further. You know, the working class create the wealth of this country, no one else. And they should have the full fruits of their labour, not just the crumbs off the table, so to speak. And these crumbs have even been taken back anyway. The reforms that we won in the past have been all threatened and been whittled away, including the National Health Service. And it's supposed to be free for all people, it doesn't matter if they're poor or rich, free at the point of need. But it's not the case, is it? Every prescription charges, what's that now these days? £8.60 a go or higher? When are you even going to really have to go to the dentist, as I know? It's like, um, the last time I read, 20, over £20 now, £20 just to see the dentist. I said, what about uh, you know, cleaning the teeth? Oh, now it's £45 to have your teeth cleaned. Who's getting this money? It's not the health service, and it's done on the basis of the health service. They're raking it off. We've got the big monopolies who are also like vultures around it. The pharmaceutical industry, 
which uh, 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 sells uh, drugs at enormously inflated prices. You know, private medicine and all the rest of it. It shouldn't be there. Health of all things is a right. Nothing to be made profit out of. And that applies every, of everything, the need, the basic needs of people, whether it's housing, jobs. Well, in other words, pro the profit system has brought us to this disaster. It's had its day, and therefore we have to fight for a new society which is, needs to be born. And now is the time because the mood in society everywhere is a feeling of that. Because socialism, you can't have socialism in one country, they must be international. And we can see where the workers are being under the cost in Europe. We talk about the European Union. Well, the reality is, you ask the Greek workers what the situation is, or the Portuguese workers, or the French workers now. But we are understand that uh, on a capitalist basis, there's no solution for working people. But uh, Marx wasn't, uh, didn't write these books as a kind of... Uh, a wonderful exercise for uh, students or intellectuals. It was a guide for the working class. In other words, Marxism was, to, was a generalized experience of the working class. Learning about the defeats, learning about the victories, and, and, and not pushing it aside, but using that as a means of advancing and changing society ourselves. And I think the Marxist analysis of a class society it's, you don't have to be, uh, agree with it, you can see it there, in black and white, where the richer become richer, and the poorer become poorer. That's what Marx explained. At the one pole, super riches. At the other pole, pole exploitation and, de and degradation. And that's the reality of capitalism in the 21st century. Who would have thought it? That you, your, your, you yourselves, the generation we have now, would be worse off than the previous generation. They'll be on the slippery slope where, where on the other hand, there's enormous advances in science and technology that can transform the whole of society if it was done in the interests, not of profit, but of people themselves. And this climate change argument. Well, if you have private companies polluting the rivers, polluting the air for their own gains, because of what drives them is not the social well-being. What drives them is profit, private profit. And therefore, they're going to cut corners like in Grenfell. They're going to they're basically look for their own, uh, their own wealth creation as opposed to the, the social needs. And the health service has to pick up the, 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 the bill, by the way, for the pollution that, it, that exists, the degradation, the stress under capitalism, the mental ill health, which goes with working under capitalism today. And the health, we have to pick up the bills for capitalism in crisis and reality. So it's, it's time for a fundamental change. And I think uh, if we, yes, join the Labour Party, uh, join the fight that's in the Labour Party, to push it to, further to the left, to bring back its socialist commitment and vision, Yes, we can have a Labour government, but we want, and we, all, we should be all out fighting for a Labour government. But we also have to say, yes, we want a Labour government that's going to change fundamentally the whole lives of working people and young people. And we voice our demand it should be a socialist policy. Don't patch up capitalism. We've tried it before. It cannot be done. We have to fundamentally do away with it and create a new society based on new values on the base of common ownership, which el el eliminates the, the need for private profit as well. You are, I know Ian's in the Baker's Unit, you are the East, I would say. The East that causes the, if you like, causes the bread to rise. Well, you, if placed in the right place, will cause the working class to uh, ferment, shall we say. I don't want to go down the beer uh, analogy that we'd be doing. But we must connect with the real struggles of working people, the real feelings of working people. And Marxism now has come of age. And therefore, you should be proud to think of the work that you're doing. But it's only the beginning, I would say. And we have to join this fight. Those who are looking for a comfortable life, I'm sorry, you've chosen a bad time to be born.
But those who want to fight for their, their future and fight to change society, this is the best time to be alive. Because this is where we can really carry through the vision that our forefathers dreamed about and make a, a real society for the benefit of everybody. And therefore do away with the slums, the war, the criminality, the degradation, the poverty, all the things, the evil things that go with capitalism. It's within our grasp. We've got to seize it. Let's build for our future. Solidarity as well. <laughs>